We already knew Lakewood police agent Ashley Ferris was a hero. Today, we see exactly why. Colorado Republicans hope to win back control of the state Senate. But he made it more difficult, and he did it for selfish reasons. Today, one of their own made it much harder. RTD has a new police chief. RTD will not say who. If a public agency makes a hire in private, does it make a sound? I thought that if more people were aware of it, then it would get better, and it's just, it's getting worse and worse by the day. Tracking tragedy on a map to help others. And we need help locat, I mean locating a resident cat. Not something you expect to be stocked at a hardware store, but we do a lot of the unexpected on Next. The news of today will not surprise you. The district attorney in Jefferson County has cleared a Lakewood police agent who shot and killed a man who'd gone on a violent rampage in December. Her quick actions likely saved more lives. The video released with the DA's announcement will make you appreciate that even more. We want to warn you, you're about to watch part of a shooting captured on video. Steve Steger helps guide us through it. I'm doing great. We should start there. Lakewood agent Ashley Ferris is a survivor. She's alive. And back in May, she told all of us what those moments in December were like at a press conference. The video released today makes you appreciate what a fighter she is. This halo camera at Alaska Advance shows Agent Ferris at 6.11 p.m. He walked up to me. Um, he was wearing a police vest and loading magazines. You have a gut feeling, and I knew that this was the guy. Um, he made a quick movement with his right hand, and I tried to stop him, tried to stop his hand. I backed up and got distance and drew my gun, um, and I told him, don't do this. And he said, I'll show you what I'll do. He shot her. She shot back. This is where we'll move the camera away from the suspect, who falls in front of her patrol car, while Ferris gets on the radio. I told him, hit! I'm hit a lot of this. Please hurry! I'm hit. I was, like, lying on the ground, and I could... I angled myself so that I could see him between the tires of my patrol vehicle. Didn't know if he was taking a prone position, didn't know if he was reloading. I just did what I could to maintain my safety. On the ground, wounded, she fired five more shots, killing the man who, on a rampage, had killed five innocent souls. Sure enough, the cavalry came in and they scooped me out of there. Great time along. I got there, so I'm going to say it. Let them know be ready for Months later, at that news conference this spring, she reflected briefly on the symbolism. I do think the irony is kind of beautiful. The shooter was a male chauvinist. A woman killed him. Well, that guy didn't like women so much, so. Ferris said that one of the moments that lingers in her mind when, was when another officer carried her into the ER at St. Anthony's Hospital, screaming, officer down, officer down. She realized she was that officer. She needed two surgeries, three weeks of recovery at the hospital. She is back at work right now, Marshall, and she is on light duty working in the investigative unit. But if you think about what could have potentially happened if she didn't get those shots off, especially when she's on the ground looking at this guy basically underneath, through underneath of her patrol car, um, who knows what would have happened? We got a lot of video today, but that's the one video that really caught our attention. And she deserves the attention. A few days after that, the Marshall fire happened, and that story kind of got pushed to the side until we got to talk with her this spring. So it, it's her due to get the recognition. Absolutely. And I don't know how you can watch that video and not realize what a hero she was in Absolutely. that situation. Thanks for going through it, Steve. Of course. Well, when we talk about bipartisan bills at the state capitol, at least in the last few years, there's a fair chance it was bipartisan because one Republican signed on, State Senator Kevin Priola. Today, he is now Democratic State Senator Kevin Priola. He switched parties overnight. And that means we need to go reset our counter because it had been three days since we last talked about a November election story in August, but only because we haven't had a show since we last talked about it on Friday. So let's reset our counter back to zero. Priola's switch to Democrat might be the thing that keeps Republicans from regaining control of the state Senate even after the November election. And based on his statement, that was his goal. Knocked on tens of thousands of doors. State Senator Kevin Priola is now a Democrat. In a two-page statement he released this morning, he wrote, even if there will continue to be issues that I disagree with the Democratic Party on, there is too much at stake right now for Republicans to be in charge. With Priola's party switch, Democrats have a 21 to 14 edge over Republicans in the state Senate. You need 18 to be the party in power. 
Half of the Senate is up for re-election in November, and without getting into too much wonky detail, there are probably seven races that will be close on Election Day. Now, with Priola's switch, Republicans will need to win five to regain power. Everything you see Kevin do now, you have to view through the lens of what would a self-serving politician do? You might say Republican State Representative Colin Larson is ticked off. Never thought that he would actually do something so cowardly and self-serving. Priola said he did it because he cannot continue to be part of a political party that is okay with a violent attempt to overturn a free and fair election. Coloradans cannot afford for their leaders to give credence to election conspiracies and climate denialism, he wrote. Larson points out that the far-right Republicans, like Ron Hanks and Tina Peters, lost in the Republican primaries for Senate and Secretary of State. Had he issued that letter on January 7th of 2021, had he issued that letter after a Ron Hanks or a Tina Peters win in the primaries this summer, then I might have believed what he was saying, that this was coming from a genuine place. The Colorado Democratic Party put out a statement today giving Priola a warm welcome with open arms. Hang on, let's go back to Priola's statement. My pro-life position, school choice, and pro-Second Amendment stance often run counter to the Democratic Party platform. This past session, Priola voted against the bill that Democratic Governor Jared Polis signed in April that put Colorado's existing abortion access into state law. Ten years ago, Priola sponsored a bill to do away with concealed carry permits. When I asked if the Democratic Party warmly welcomes that Kevin Priola, I was told, we understand we will not agree on every issue, but we are a big tent party that works to uplift all Coloradans. Immediately after announcing his party switch, several Republicans brought up the idea of recalling Priola. Senate Minority Leader John Cook, who is term limited and out after this year, said in a statement, Priola's new district will likely not be happy with this announcement and may explore their options for new representation. Michael Fields, who has funded several conservative ballot issues, wrote on social media explicitly, Kevin Priola needs to be recalled. As a Republican, Priola won his re-election in 2020 by just 1,200 votes. But because of redistricting, he now has new constituents in Brighton, Henderson, Fort Lupton, and Greeley. 47% are unaffiliated. 25% are Democrat and Republican. Recall attempts against the Democratic governor and a handful of Democratic state lawmakers have failed spectacularly in the last few years. The trial finally started in the case against a Douglas County mom who tried to get fellow QAnon supporters to kidnap her son. Cynthia Absug is accused of planning an armed raid to kidnap her son out of the foster care system. The boy had been removed from her care after allegations of abuse. Investigators found out about the plot from Absug's daughter, who was also being removed from the home. Absug was arrested in Montana in 2019. She pleaded not guilty in 2020. The trial's been delayed several times since then. Today, we finally got to opening statements, and the trial is supposed to be a quick one, expected to wrap up Thursday. You can't put a pin on grief. But five years ago, one grieving brother started an effort to put a pin on tragedy. Five years later, unfortunately, the so-called overdose map continues to grow. Our own Katie Eastman has more on this difficult journey. Kevin was kind, gentle, talented. Brooke Perez says their story out loud. Crystal was a daughter, sister, friend, talented, loved of her playing the guitar. What made her feel the most free and what she loved. Because if she doesn't hide what happened. She's more than just a number and we will never forget. Maybe others won't hide while they can still help or get help. Hey, my brother and sister both suffered for over a decade with this addiction. You know, even when my sister died, it was kind of, it still was this tough love approach. Um, you know, we, you know, go and get the help you need. Don't reach out to us. You know, it's a choice kind of thing. And um, <laughs> just kind of educating ourselves on this, me and my family is like, it's not a choice, it's a disease. Brooke shared her brother and sister's stories on the lost loved ones map a way for families to share about those lost to opioids and addiction. It's, it's really sad to see where it's just continuing getting worse. When so, Jeremiah Lindemann you know, made the map in 2017, he didn't think people would still be posting on it today. You know, sadly, there's more families finding it and, and adding their stories too. Lindemann made the map to show that the opioid epidemic was everywhere. The first dot on it was his brother, JT. A few years ago, it was such a hidden disease of something families would want to bury and not talk about. And I refuse to let them go down as just a number. Brooke won't hide the truth as fentanyl causes more families to add to the map. 
It only makes her tell Kevin and Crystal's stories louder. And we need to talk about it and do something about it. Katie Eastman, Nine News. Brooke has also started an organization in honor of her brother and sister, KK Fearless, to continue to erase the stigma of addiction. Over the last week, we've worked together to help expand the scholarship program in honor of a leader in the East Colfax community, Ma Kang. Here's Kyle with an update on your word of thanks. This is Ma Kang's garden, and this is Ma Kang's community, uh, East Colfax, where she advocated for the immigrants and refugees who live here, and it's where she was killed in a shooting. The Refugee Action Coalition put together enough money for four scholarships for driven people from this community who are headed off to pursue higher education. Through your word of thanks donations, you've put together another 27 scholarships and counting for people in the community who are headed off to school to study early childhood education, nursing, business, even neurosurgery. And maybe people will chip in a few more dollars and create a few more scholarships along the way. Your word of thanks campaigns have now raised $9.4 million for Coloradans in all corners of this state. Back on Wednesday with our next idea. RTD has a new police chief. The public agency just won't tell us who. Some free things in Denver could get more expensive if voters agree. He is the family here. He was the glue. He made an impression on everybody who stopped by this store. Now, Morris the cat is missing. Neighbors are trying to track him down. Next. Libraries, which offer a lot of free services, are not free. And Denver Public Library has told the city it needs to ask voters for a property tax increase. Tonight, Denver City Council will consider putting a property tax hike on the Denver ballot this November. If voters give their approval, the average homeowner in Denver would pay about 50 bucks more per year. The ongoing tax would generate about $36 million next year for Denver libraries. Money to get the libraries back to normal hours instead of reduced hours. Pay raises for librarians, enhanced programs for kids, communities of color and immigrants and refugees and funding for building improvements. And with that, we have to reset our counter again because we made it a whole seven minutes without talking about the November election in August. Denver's also considering fee increases for parks and rec, which could mean golf camping and weddings are more expensive. Denver Parks and Rec shared its fee proposals last week. A round of golf could go for about five bucks more. Renting venues in Denver's parks for weddings or events could also cost more each hour. And getting an RV site at Denver's mountain parks may cost more. Except for golf and city park pavilion, the city notes that it has not raised fees since 2009. This fee increase, however, does not go to a vote of the people. City Council will discuss and decide later this month and vote by September. Researchers at CSU are joining a global effort to learn more about how viruses spread from animals to humans, like the top theory about how COVID came to be. Turns out we don't know much about what animal viruses are floating around out there, so researchers are trying to use artificial intelligence to fill in some gaps. There are so many millions of viruses that um, we know nothing about. We are studying pathogens that we know can infect humans, but we are also trying to use machine learning approaches to um, kind of ascertain or predict um, which hosts certain viruses might be able to infect. Anna Fagri with the research team says this kind of large scale research is possible because of technology. Sequencing the genetic material of viruses is faster and cheaper with today's computers. RTD is getting a new police chief tomorrow. Who the public agency is hiring is a mystery to the public at least. RTD's calendar lists a swearing in at 10 a.m. We asked who RTD hired to lead the 600-person police department. RTD told us we'll find out at the swearing-in. We asked what the hiring process was for the position. We were told we could ask about that at the news conference, too. The department's last chief resigned in March after five years in that job. RTD is dealing with rising crime, especially at Union Station. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock said the problems are growing as a result of kicking people out of Civic Center Park. 
Well, we saw a little dusting of snow across uh, the higher terrain early this morning. The top of those 14ers like Berthoud Pass, Pikes Peak. Tonight, we're still keeping a close eye to the high country as we do have some pretty slow moving thunderstorms and unfortunately flash flooding too. As we look on HD Doppler 9, most of the action positioned just to the north of I-70 into Grand County where we do have a flash flood warning currently and then everything else sinking to the south. We'll zoom in right there because we just got word of some mudslides going on along Highway 125. They have shut it down in both directions. So just kind of keep that in mind if you are traveling around there. By 11 o'clock, most of the action is done. Tomorrow morning, we wake up to some sunshine. Thunderstorms will fire back up tomorrow afternoon, but primarily stay up in the mountains. It should be a relatively dry day here in Denver as this ridge of high pressure starts to roll in, helping to warm us up just a bit. We'll be back to the upper 80s, lower 90s here for the metro with some 60s and 70s in the high country. And then the thunderstorms, they will make a comeback by the end of the week. A mystery in a small mountain town. Morris is a big part of us, and you know, without him here, he's just, you know, it's, it's not the same. Not your typical cat story, if there is such a thing as a typical cat story. Next. Stories about missing cats don't always make the news, but every single one of them can leave a family heartbroken, and that's the case for the team at the Ace Hardware in Granby. Our Noel Brennan stopped by the store that's fully stocked, but still feels empty. How are you today? Good, how are you? Good. A hardware store stocks what you need. Perfect. And what you never knew you needed. We used to say we carry everything but underwear, but we carry underwear now. <laughs> Even staff at Country Ace Hardware in Granby find something unexpected in the aisles. So Morris came to us probably about two years ago. It's kind of an importer exporter of uh, neighbors. We were having a mouse problem and we needed something um, <laughs> to, to help us with that. Yeah, Morris is our store cat. Morris made a hardware store home and joined it its is. family. Morris is my man. Morris is a big part of us. We have neighbors and kids and tourists coming in looking specifically for Morris. He was known to be found right there laying and just basking in the, the warm glow of the lights. Last Tuesday, Morris took his usual morning walk. Every morning, 9 o'clock on the dot, he would go out the store, kind of look around in the parking lot, turn around and come back in. No one saw what security cameras captured until it was too late. Somebody kidnapped him. Because we have the picture, we have the car, we have the video of them actually putting him in the car. So we know he's with them and we just, it may have been a mistake. They may have thought that he was a stray. Um, that's fine. We just want Morris back. I want him back so much. I don't hear him in the morning and it's, it's too quiet. It really is like we're missing a part of the team. The place that has everything you'd need. Just this guy for you. Is missing what can't be replaced. We'll get him back. That's my biggest hope. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Just give Morris back. Granby police are investigating. It's a sign that Colorado traffic can be cartoonishly tense. That and some feedback about what I do on that screen over there. It's a sign that a roughest, toughest truck would like some space. Back off! That's my best Yosemite Sam impression. It's really bad. Uh, back off, says Yosemite Sam from the back of this gas truck. We ain't hauling milk. Kevin shared this loony message from his drive on I-25 near the Spear exit. See a sign that makes you chuckle from a safe distance or try to find some old YouTube of Yosemite Sam so you can try to figure out how he talks? Email us at next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Some feedback tonight about uh, Priola, Kevin Priola switching parties. Spider Monk says, way to stand up for the constituents that voted you in and perhaps may vote him out if they seek a recall. And Zach says, I want to be the next Steve Kornacki and he approves of that choice. I'm all for using the touch screen, but rolling up my sleeves and wearing khakis that's not for me. I'm a tie-in suit guy. We'll see you next time.